There we go. Okay, today I'm going to be introducing everyone to the concept of patient reported measurement. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, I'm going to start this presentation off, um, first of all, by telling you I don't have any conflict of interest. I'm going to start this presentation off by introducing you to the concepts of patient reported measurement. What, what are they? What do they mean? Um, how do they contribute to patient centered care? Talk to you a little bit and introduce you to our patient, our provincial patient reported measurement strategy. And then we're going to have a little bit more of an interactive session where we're going to apply the concepts within the strategy where we're going to actually uh, go through the framework um, with an example together to try to apply the concepts of patient reported measurement to our strategy. And through this uh, talk, I'm going to weave in um, throughout the areas where we engaged patients and people with lived experience in the development of our strategy and also how they're embedded throughout the strategy. Uh, so just the first part of this presentation is going to be a little bit more of me um, just providing you information before we get into the second part being introductory. So I'm going to start about talking about patient-centered care. Um, really, this is the ultimate goal, and we talk a lot about patient-centered care in our healthcare system. It's um, the goal of our health system's transformation is to provide high-quality patient-centered care. The question though um, is how do we know if we're providing patient-centered care? How do we measure this? What's the process we go through to measure this? Our ultimate goal of our healthcare system and, and what we do in our daily lives is to improve the outcomes for patients. So how do we measure outcomes? So right now, currently health outcomes are conventionally measured uh, from a clinical and health system perspective, um, or healthcare provider perspective, I should say. So we're usually asking questions around, like, was the treatment a success? Has the wound healed? Um, are the lab indicators within a normal range? Um, or at a systems level, we basically focus on volume and cost such as how many doctor's visits, how many prescriptions filled, um, what's the cost of our dialysis program in Manitoba, um, or we focus on uh, adverse outcomes, such as mortality, hospital readmission rates, hospital acquired infections, length of stay, all really, really important measures. But there's a measurement, an identified measurement gap here, and that is we're missing information uh, from the patient's perspective. So things like, did the treatment achieve the goals I hoped for? Was my healthcare encounter respectful? Can I function optimally at work and in my personal life? We can't know if we're providing high quality patient-centered care if we don't include the patient's perspective into the way we measure our healthcare system. And one way to do this is through patient-reported measures, which is what we're going to talk about today. So, Patient reported measures are of uh, two of them are affectionately known as PROMs and PREMs. Um, PROMs are patient reported outcome measures. And they focus on asking patients to provide information about aspects of their health as it relates to their quality of life. So things like symptoms, functional status, uh, physical, mental, or social health. Um, and they provide insight into the effectiveness of care from the patient's perspective. They can be designed to assess very general health-related quality of life um, that we can compare across groups. So just very general health-related uh, health quality of life, or they can uh, solicit information really specific to a particular disease or condition. So those are known as um, uh, disease-specific or condition-specific PROMs. And then we have patient reported experience measures. Um, now, while related to PROMs, they are significantly different in that the focus here is on the patient's uh, perspective of receiving care. So focusing more on service delivery and processes of care, like cleanliness of waiting rooms, bedside manner, or whether a patient feels they were adequately involved in care decision-making. These tools are used a little more often uh, to evaluate and monitor service delivery. So together, 
they are they are an integral part of uh, patient patient centered care, uh, and they're unique in that they are measurements that come directly from the patient and not in, uh, interpreted by others or other clinical professionals. So what are they exactly is that they're standardized questionnaires and they're known for having very good psychometric properties. So let's unpack that for a sec. What are psychometric properties? Well, they're ones that have gone through rigorous testing to ensure that they're valid, reliable, and responsive among other psychometric properties. So by valid, we mean, and I'll just talk a little bit about this. We're not getting, this is not what this presentation is about, but just so we understand the difference between what, what prompts and prompts are versus what they're not. Um, valid questions mean that they measure what they intend to measure. When they're reliable, they consistently measure the same thing across time or across different patients. And when they're responsive, uh, that refers to the ability of the questionnaire to detect clinically important changes over time, even if those changes are small. Patient reported measures, like I said, are also direct. Um, they, they come right from the patient. So there's no interpretation. It's not like we're not doing a qualitative analysis um, on, on the, 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 the results of patient feedback. It's just direct from patients and, and uh, we get a score. We calculate a score based on the feedback. Um, and they're timely. This is another thing that's gonna come up through this presentation and important to pay attention to when we go to apply this stuff later on. Timely means that we need, re it provides us with real-time feedback from patients about, um, or as close to real-time as possible, about how uh, our services are uh, affecting their care or how their treatment is impacting their quality of life. So to wrap that up into uh, an overall picture, like other traditional clinical measures that are standardized, valid, reliable instruments, like say blood pressure or heart rate, um, Patient reported measures enable a consistent and structured method for collecting information directly from patients without interpretation from a healthcare provider. This information is then used to build a clearer picture of patient health and over time, a picture of health outcomes across populations. Another aspect of patient reported measures is that we usually like to use them in, in um, conjunction with other important clinical or administrative information. So we don't typically use especially PROMs on their own, um, although we can. So uh, just on the flip side, so uh, collecting information from patients through surveys is something we do all the time in healthcare. And it's a really important and we should continue to do it and we will continue to do it. Um, but there, it, this is a little bit of a different tool than what I'm talking about today. Um, and we can't, the, the thing about making up surveys uh, and, and asking patients questions related to those surveys is that we can't use them in a, in a consistent way. Um, or we don't usually, um, the, they can't be used say to compare uh, quality of life indicators um, with, from Manitoba to Alberta or Manitoba to Canadian norms. Whereas when we use standardized tools like uh, PROMs, we can, um, they can be comparable over time. So semi-structured interviews or um, you know, questionnaires that we rapidly put together to answer really important emerging issues are all really important, um, but not, not what patient reported measures are. Okay, so how are they used? Um, Patient reported measures are used in conjunction with other health data to evaluate healthcare effectiveness across all levels of our healthcare system. So at, from the individual micro level right up to the health system level. So at a micro level, um, PROMS data, for, for example, can be used and is used to enhance patient and provider communication or inform care pathways and encourage shared decision making. So you would see this, say we do this right now, for example, at cancer care, we regularly collect patient reported outcome measures to help inform the patient 
um, cancer journey. And you can imagine quality of life being a really important indicator on, on something like cancer and, and making decisions around cancer treatment. At the health service level, we use aggregate patient reported measurement data um, to guide quality improvement efforts for outcomes as well as patient safety. Um, data can be used to identify gaps in care, evaluate health programs, and we, we're doing that right now actually at the health service level, assess and monitor the outcome, uh, outcomes of a group of patients over time, and evaluate the impact of healthcare services. And finally, at the macro or health systems level, um, these data can be used to help policymakers establish and evaluate broader policies meant to, given, uh, meant to benefit a given population. There also uh, can be uh, uh, used to compare outcomes over time, locally, even regionally, or nationally, if we're all using the same tools, the same collection tools, the same PROM. Um, and they're a key, uh, a key component of value-based care, which is not something I'm going to talk a lot about today, but value-based care is uh, a movement in um, shifting away from measuring quality and measuring a healthcare system with a focus on volume and shifting more to a focus on value, where the numerator of that is patient-reported outcome measure, so the outcomes that matter to patients, and the denominator is the cost of care. So it provides us with really important data um, at all levels um, of our healthcare system. So using patient reported measures at all these levels puts the patient's voice in, into clinical care decisions, evaluation of our health services, um, as well as the performance of our healthcare system. And really it, it signals a shift in the orientation of our healthcare system from one that is system-centered to one that is person or patient-centered. So that, that is the end of the background uh, portion of the presentation. However, I know probably uh, because I just gave you a taste of what patient-reported measures are, there's probably a lot of questions. Um, and which is why we're going to go through the strategy and try to apply those concepts to the strategy. And I'm hoping that through that, um, you'll be able to interact with me and ask questions. Uh, and hopefully some of your questions will be answered. Just before I do that though, I'm gonna give you just a tiny bit of a background um, on the patient reported measurement strategy and how, um, how we put that together. So, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, the CHI um, had a few consultations with, with healthcare um, professionals and healthcare stakeholders in our system about um, the value of collecting patient reported measures and whether we thought we needed to do this in a more systematic way in our healthcare system. Um, of course, we got unanimous support. Um, everyone from people with lived experience to clinicians, researchers, even health systems leaders, everyone agrees that this, there is a gap. Um, and this isn't anything new. I mean, there's, there's lots of health systems that have incorporated using patient reported measures in a more systematic way. The UK, the United States, Australia's whole, um, they've moved to value-based care. So they incorporate patient reported measurements at a systemic level in their health system. So it's not a new concept, like a lot of people understand about this, but just where do we start here in Manitoba? And the agreement was that we really need to start with a strategy. So that's what this strategy is about. So in January of 2020, um, the CHI pulled together a team of 20 uh, healthcare stakeholders, um, including people with lived experience, um, data scientists. We had analysts as well, um, digital health, shared health, Manitoba health, research institutes, clinicians. Um, so 20 people got together over the course of one year, five times to put together this strategy. The overall aim of the strategy is to enhance the use of patient reported measures in our province. And the strategy itself is essentially a framework, which is what you're seeing on the screen here, and a set of recommendations, um, again, to enhance the use and support the use of patient reported measures in our province. We involved um, people with lived experience throughout the development of the strategy. So we uh, had an advisory committee. These are three members of our 
advisory committee and they were obviously at all our meetings but also were really involved in in some of the writing um, of the strategy we did some initial consultations with not just cultural communities but with a a small sample of, uh, of uh, organizations um, outside of our healthcare system and actually got some very great feedback and some interest in continued involvement in the strategy. So just to quickly highlight some of the things we heard from the communities, um, first and foremost, the importance of communication um, because it would be really helpful if you're gonna be asked to fill out forms at, at your doctor's office or in a hospital that you understand why you're doing that because once people know why and what this is about people can really get behind answering these types of questionnaires and they know how these data are going to be used um, related to that is that concept of trust so there were a lot there was a lot of discussion about how different groups and different people, depending on where they come from, have different levels of trust with our system and that we need to acknowledge that and uh, have ways of uh, working with different communities and again, focus in on communication and communicating with patients. There were some concerns, again, related to trust and communication. There were concerns about accidentally systematically excluding people. Uh, say people who don't speak English as, a, as their first language, um, people with low literacy levels, um, and different, different groups of people that may have issues of trust if we're not willing to address those issues and communicate effectively um, at the outset of a program. We also heard that different cultures may respond differently to questions related to quality of life or experience of care, because for example, they may come from a country or a place where sharing experiences of care is not really safe to do. Or we heard from some groups that different people or different cultures um, grow up under like, uh, I guess, processing certain quality of life indicators like pain differently, and they may not want to talk, it may not be culturally acceptable to talk about or complain about pain. So they may rate pain differently than say another group of people where it's okay to express, you know, that they're experiencing a lot of pain. So there was some concern about whether different groups of people based on their experience or their cultural background may express um, things differently, may report things differently. Um, and Finally, uh, and there, there's actually quite a bit more, but, but these are the real highlights is that people want to be able to see and learn from the results in a way that is meaningful and in a way they can understand, which makes sense. Uh, generally, people want to see um, their patient data, whether it's clinical or patient reported data, Pe people wanna see their data. Um, we also involved uh, people with lived experience in developing aspects of the strategy and our own um, CHI's public and patient engagement collaborative partnership um, co-developed a standalone guideline and resource for to, to support our health service and our health system in engaging people with lived experience in um, patient reported measurement initiatives. So you can find that resource at this location and we can talk more about where to find resources and, and everything later on. Um, but this is just a screenshot of that. So it's a four page document, again, that just is providing people that may, like in our health system that may not be used to engaging people with lived experience in initiatives, just some tips and um, information about how to do that. And again, that was, uh, co-written uh, by and, and heavily influenced by our, our, our public and patient engagement collaborative. Finally, uh, as we go through the strategy, you'll see where we have embedded um, involving people with lived experience throughout all aspects of the strategy. So it's this engage at every stage um, concept. So right from developing uh, right from being part of the uh, a part of a, a team, right from the beginning, but also uh, developing a shared understanding of the purpose, right through to collecting the um, the different tools, the 
proms and prems questionnaires, data collection strategies, reporting results. I mean, input and involvement of people with lived experience of whatever condition it is you're looking at um, is really critically important. They bring a really important perspective. So giving an example of something like chronic kidney disease, um, it, it's really, and I've had some experience with, with this, which is why it uh, resonates as an example. Um, by involving people with lived experience um, on our team, for example, we weren't going to collect patient reported experience measures, but we heard from them that that's a really important thing for them. They want to be able to talk about their experience of receiving care from our nephrologists and from our team. Um, and so we ended up changing um, our process to include not just PROMs, but also PREMs. Um, they also talked to us about the length of some of our tools being that, you know, three questions is a little bit long and that probably people wouldn't fill them out or that even though people prefer electronic strategies, we need to make sure that we have uh, another strategy for people who don't have as much electronic access to things, especially our rural and remote um, people who have chronic kidney disease or on dialysis. Um, we may have to collect patient reported measures by phone or by paper survey. So important feedback at every stage. So now uh, we're at the interactive stage of the presentation. Trisha, I'm looking over at you. You don't know that, but you're on my other screen. So at this part of the presentation, I'm going to go through the different parts of the strategy. And together, we're going to work through applying the concepts. And I'm hoping that this will make it a little more interactive and easier to understand what patient reported measures are and how we might use them in a scenario. So the scenario I'm going to put out there is collecting patient reported outcome measures or, or patient reported experience measures as part of our provincial hip and knee replacement surgery program. So we're responsible and we're going to start right away at partnerships and engagement. Um, so, sorry, the, these two uh, check boxes here at, at the side here are the recommendations that are associated with this particular section of the framework. So these are the two provincial recommendations. And so working together, let's talk about what a multidisciplinary team might look like for a hip and knee surgery program that wants to start embedding patient reported measurements in their into their surgical program. Does anyone want to throw out some names of, of people that we think might be important around a multidisciplinary team? Physiotherapist, and, okay. we see. Physiotherapist, excellent. Patients who have had that condition. Oh boy, people yeah. are going in the chat, this is awesome. Surgeons. Yes, very important. A uh, health professional, including managers, surgeons, patients, and the follow-up team. Yes, sounds like people who have maybe some experience even with this. <laughs> uh, OTs, occupational therapists, and pharmacists. Yep, excellent. Producers of the replacement joints. Oh, interesting. I never thought of that. Patients on the wait list. Okay, yep. I'll just add some that haven't come up yet that are often not thought of, and that are things like your um, maybe analysts um, like that are involved in that might be able to help you depending on how you collect things uh, with your da database or how you structure a database. So data analysts, um, biostatisticians, these are also important members of the team, but but excellent, excellent um, feedback. Okay, Next slide. I've moved your faces so I can now see you on my screen, but I have to move you around here. Okay, so the next component of the strategy is uh, the purpose. And in, in this section, we talk about the importance of establishing um, a purpose up front because that actually impacts and guides all subsequent decision-making. 
from the selection of your tool to how you report it and use it. Um, and so I, I touched on some reasons at the micro, meso, and macro level of why you might want to um, use patient reported measures. And so maybe we could just, again, just brainstorm like, and you, and you can use them at any levels you want, but what, what would be a purpose that we could come up with for collecting patient reported measures for our surgical program? Again, hints are there's at the micro level, the individual patient provider level, the MISO level, health system or health service level, and then the health system. What are different ways that? So Kelly says uh, improve patient experience. Okay. Yeah. We want to improve our patient experience through hip and knee replacement. Decrease wait times from Lindsay. Okay. Carrie says, improve the space. Okay, yeah. Lirius says, utilization of PT outpatient hours for follow-up visits. How many visits are usually required? Okay. Um, Josh says, to assess the returns to the care system for things like infection, pain management, et cetera. Uh, Rich says, knowledge translation to make the system more responsive in future. I think KT stands for knowledge translation. Yeah. Jacqueline says, determining gaps in care transition as patients transition from hospital to community. Excellent. And Trisha says, improve patient flow through system. All excellent answers. And actually, you guys gave me more detail than I even expected, so that's great. Um, just at, a, at some broad levels, one re re reason you might want to collect in surgery is you might want to do a better job of informing clinical decision making. It actually helps to know what your quality of life, uh, like where you're at with quality of life and where you hope to go. Uh, it makes decisions on what type of surgery you do and what surgical approach you, you, would, you would take. Um, so that's that's at that micro level where the where the surgeon would actually review with you your prom how you applied to to your patient reported outcome measure. Um, so that's supporting that patient journey, um, it, and and informing clinical decision making. Those are two. Uh, another one, of course, is like as people touched on in here, it's quality improvement generally. Quality improvement. Another one is actually performance. It can, it, proms and prems can be used to be part of that performance discussion with surgeons. And in our hip and knee program, we do use proms uh, as part and patient satisfaction as part of our performance discussion with surgeons. And then, you know, proms, they are used uh, and they have a long history of use in clinical research, but they can be used uh, in a, a research also at a health systems level. Are they, and when you're collecting these tools uh, and this information in your program, the research is another legitimate uh, purpose. So we'll see, you'll see as we move along how your purpose and objectives for, for collecting these tools will impact um, decisions that you make later on. Having said that, I do want to stop for a moment and say that the reason, the feedback I got from, from the team that we worked with is that we didn't actually want to have this look like, you know, start here and then go here and then go here, which is why we don't really have arrows, but we have more of a, a flowy kind of diagram here because, you know, this is a little more iterative than it is just like a linear structured kind of model. So, okay, so now we're at selecting our tools. So I touched on this a little bit uh, before, um, but one of the things that we, so these are our recommendations. These are three recommendations. One of the recommendations that we've made provincially, and again, this is based on a lot of review of the literature and interviews with you know, other stakeholders across our country that are, used, are doing this, is we've recommended across our province that where possible, if you're collecting patient reported outcome measures that you at least collect a generic 
prom called the EQ5D5L, which is a, um, a, a five dimension, five level prom that asks very basic questions about pain, functionality, um, your, your mental health, um, five, five questions, five quality of life questions related to that. Um, and the reason we picked that is because uh, the EQ5D5L is being used quite a bit um, in other programs in Canada. It also uh, is used extensively around the world and has been validated in hundreds of languages, including Canadian French and, and uh, a, a whole host of other reasons. And so um, that is a, a provincial recommendation. Having knowing though that that is a very broad measure that it will allow us to compare across provinces or across different programs. Like we could compare the quality of life outcomes for hip and knee surgery versus spine surgery or versus um, cataract surgery. Uh, we, it's not a very sensitive measure. So it won't necessarily be a, do a good job of helping us measure changes related to you know, your hip mobility and related to the specific condition that you've come into the healthcare system for. Um, and so that's why we recommend that you pair it with a generic patient reported measure. So there are really um, hundreds of patient reported, validated patient reported measures to choose from. And so uh, we also came up with a set of criteria to help um, people to choose a particular uh, generic prom, or sorry, condition specific prom. And we recommend in our strategy that of course you have people with lived experience around this table uh, and you'll see why. Um, so obviously the first thing is what we talked about earlier that you wanna have a good level of psychometric evidence. So this is that it's reliable and valid and responsive. Um, you want a track record if possible of widespread use and successful implementation. Um, your questionnaire content such that the questions provide the right data to respond to that specific objective. So, so like what I just said, when collecting, um, when selecting a prom, both a generic and condition specific prom should be used together. Patient acceptance. Is it culturally appropriate? What's the response burden? Is it too long? Is it too short? Is it the appropriate literacy level? And so selection of these tools should consider both the clinician and the patient needs. Um, is it validated in multiple languages? What about feasibility? What do we mean by feasibility? Well, a lot of these tools have licensing fees. They have data reporting requirements even. Um, there may be costs to implement them that you didn't consider. There may be administrative uh, burden and resources um, related to, you know, if you're, if, you're at, if you're going to use a number of tools uh, and you're not using an electronic data collection approach, then you're going to have a lot of data entry that you have to consider. Um, and, and, and then, of course, uh, again, the patient response burden is, is part of that. Uh, the potential for Canadian normative comparisons and international comparability. So are there benchmarks available to guide your interpretation? And that's what I meant a little bit, um, that EQ5D5L, for example, we do have Canadian um, normative comparisons. So we could collect the EQ5D5L here in Manitoba, and in many cases, we'd be able to have Canadian data to compare it to, to see how the quality of life indicators for our patients compared to, to the national norm. Um, clinical and health system applicability, and then were patients involved or engaged in the development? This might seem like a no-brainer, but traditionally patients were not necessarily involved in, um, in developing patient-reported measures. So, this is our checklist for collecting proms. And it's a bit difficult for me to ask the group to now come up with proms because uh, you wouldn't know any of, of them, but this would be sort of the, the process that you would want to go through. 
Now, there are some conditions um, and some situations where we don't have to put a lot of work into this because there's already a national uh, strategy or a national um, recommendation. And that is the case for hip and knee surgery. And so we do have uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Information, who is sort of leading this work nationally, has come out with a um, some uh, guidelines for collecting. Uh, actually, I just this is the screenshot actually for the international guidelines, not the national guidelines, but we do have national guidelines, um, and they. Um, and our national guidelines to mirror the international guidelines. So you can imagine the, the strength of that is that if we're all collecting the same measures, how we can compare outcomes globally um, and compare uh, outcomes nationally. Okay, still on data collection. We did come out with a strong statement uh, in our provincial group, and that is that we really need to move uh, forward with electronic data collection. So up until now, patient reported measures have been primarily collected by paper, uh, manually, manually data, um, data is manually entered into local databases. So local to your program. Unfortunately, I mean, compared to paper-based approaches, electronic data collection is really the gold standard. Um, it reduces data entry time, administrative burden, and error. Um, they're generally uh, preferred by patients, even older patients, although people like to say, well, older people don't always understand electronics. That's not actually been shown to be true in the literature. Um, and they should be incorporated into the medical record, just like clinical data. So it's providing data in a way uh, that can be linked to other data in a privacy appropriate manner. Um, linked to other clinical data, other administrative data to give us a more full understanding of, um, uh, of the patient journey and of the patient experience. So we, um, we do recommend that. Um, now we have recognized due to, um, again, input from our community and um, from the pe pe people with lived experience on our team that there are groups of people that will not be able to benefit from electronic data collection. Um, they will not have uh, good access necessarily, say to the internet or to even a computer. And so there may be uh, circumstances and patient populations where we might have to administer a patient reported measure by phone or by paper. Um, I suddenly realized the time, wow, quarter two. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit faster now. Um, moving now to, oh, I'm still in data collection. Yeah, another aspect of data collection uh, here to consider is the timing and frequency. So let's talk about timing. First of all, there's three main um, ways you might wanna collect patient reported measures. There's pre-post, so pre-intervention, post-intervention longitudinally over time or cross-sectionally, so in a snapshot of time. Frequency relates to if it's pre-post, is it just before and immediately after? Is it before and after and then one year after? How, how, what's the frequency? If it's longitudinally, is it every time the patient comes in to see the physician? Is it every six months? Is it every month? Uh, and then you can see here, we talk about using a census approach versus a sample-based approach. So a census approach is where every single person coming to receive the service, so everybody coming in for hip and knee surgery has a prompt. That's the ideal. There are situations where we might not be able to do that and have to use a, a sample-based approach. Can anyone guess where we might be using a sample-based approach more often? This is a, if you can answer this one, it means you're in the advanced section of, it's a little tricky. I can give hints when the hint is needed. Where might we, we're already doing this in our health system right now, actually. Anyone? Rich says remote locations. Okay, yep. So where we actually use it now, and it does involve remote locations, although I would argue if you're receiving a service in a remote location, 
and we're collecting, we might want to still collect everybody's proms for, for surgery, for example, um, because you'd be coming in for surgery. But, but an example of where we do it right now is actually with PREMS. And you more often do this when you're looking for the patient experience of a program. And the example where we're using it right now is the, the uh, Canadian Patient Experience Survey for Inpatient Care. So if you come into the hospital and have an overnight in the hospital, you're automatically sent a survey, but not everybody is. We do a sample of the population and there they receive uh, of a survey. And so in this approach, the reason we uh, recommend consulting a biostatistician is that you want to make sure you have a representative sample um, for that data to be meaningful. Okay. Uh, now reporting, I mean, this is very important. Uh, I won't go into this a whole lot. Uh, we do have a section in our strategy, a whole section that talks about the facilitators and barriers to reporting. And of course, there's this goes with whatever you're doing. It's not unique to patient reported measures. Um, there are ways that we might wanna report to clinicians that are different than patients. Um, but that really the success of a patient reported measurement program lies not only in the successful collection and analysis of our data, but in how this information is translated into knowledge and used to advance patient care and our health system goals. So we need to think about knowledge translation strategies up front and involve people with lived experience in that. And I include this slide just to show you, this is how we report to surgeons. And you can see that in the Oxford 12, these are PROMs. Um, kind of confusing, not probably the way we might wanna report to patients, um, but, but it turns out that clinicians they want to see the science of it, to believe it and understand it and get behind it. So we tend to get more scientific -y and make sure that they understand that we use a valid approach and, and, and go in more in that direction with clinicians, where with patients, we, this is one example. It's not a very sexy example, and I couldn't find a really good example, but something a little more clear, where you can see here with self-care, um, it's really clear that pre um, you know, there's only about 25% of people said they had no problems with, with, with self-care. Whereas afterwards, 50% of patients said, I don't have any problem with self-care. So you, you know, the, you make things a little clearer, but also patients have reported that they want to see things in, in, in numbers that are meaningful to them that they use on a regular basis, like percentages. Um, they don't want fancy statistics necessarily. Um, Okay, so my final slide before we can open this up to, to talking about this is pulling this all together to talk about how does this look in an overall system. This is my little picture here of my, how I imagine um, a learn, an ideal learning health system. And I, I just did a presentation on what is a learning health system. And this is based on um, a, a model put out by the National Academy of Medicine who put out a, a, a seminal paper on what a learning health system is and, and, and why we need a learning health system. And what it is fundamentally at the base of a learning health system is the information and interaction between the clinical services, the clinician and the patient. And in a learning health system, the clinical data that is, is collected from the patient encounter and the patient reported, and keep in mind, this is ideal. This is not what we're doing, this is ideal. And the patient reported measures are fed into a central data repository, if you will, or a computer or a database, whatever you wanna call it. And uh, this data um, is then passed up to this whole support system of research scientists, data scientists, informaticists, um, bench, bench researchers, clinical scientists, all of whom are receiving this information and of course have all kinds of other important information that they use in their jobs. And they're coming up with methods and ideas of how to improve patient care. And they're contributing that back down to again to this electronic system. This is a real time electronic system. Um, could be could look like this dashboard here. This dashboard is actually a patient dashboard, but um, could be a clinical dashboard. Um, but it's real-time information um, being passed up and then the learnings are being passed back down and then those learnings are being applied, again, back in, fed back into 
um, our, our uh, interactions uh, between the physician and the patient. And then we're learning further from that and feeding that back up and they're further refining and this is going back into the system and around and around we go. And if you Google learning health system and then press image, you'll see that all the learning health systems images in, involve a circle. So it's, it's continuous learning. It's a continuous learning cycle. But for me today, I wanted to emphasize that um, a pa a patients, uh, patients are an integral part of that learning health system. Um, and that's not something I just came up with. That, that is part of the National Academy of Medicine's learning health system model. Um, and so that is uh, the end of my presentation today. I open it up to, to discussion. I'll just say that our patient reported measurement strategy, um, while we have launched it, we are now starting the hard task of implementation and we have our first um, implementation meeting in January where we're, we do have a, um, a series of next steps that are included as part of the strategy. Um, so we're gonna try to nibble away at, um, at actually implementing the pieces of the strategy. Uh, we have one, one question from a minute or two ago. Helen asked if you're able to share the reference for the mentioned work on learning health systems. So I don't know if we'll have the presentation later to share. Yeah, ab absolutely, you'll have the presentation and um, I can definitely give you the reference. Uh, it's called Best Care Lower Cost by, from that, this was a document uh, that came out about five years ago from the National Academy of Medicine. And I think that's the reference you're referring to. I can definitely share that. And yeah, if anyone has questions, um, you should be able to start your video and unmute yourself, or you can raise your hand using the participants uh, button. There's a lot of uh, information in that presentation, and I kind of gave you a really big overview. I think I could spend 45 minutes on any one aspect of that strategy. And so I always find this very challenging in um, but I hope that the overall idea of um, embedding information from patients uh, into the way we measure our healthcare system is a way of engaging uh, and, and getting patient feedback um, uh, and, and really shifting our thinking again from, from a system that's really uh, clinical and system-centered to more patient-centered. Um, and this idea that we can't really know if we're providing patient-centered care without asking patients whether the care we're providing is meeting their needs. So that's really a, a big take-home message for me today. I have a question for you, Sarah. Um, what, what kind of work do we need to do to address um, issues around data sharing between different healthcare service providers, at least in Manitoba? What are, like, what are we up against? Um, well, that's a whole other presentation, Trish. But yeah, I guess um, currently, I mean, I shared that, that slide that, and I made a point of saying that's not currently how we share or use data. Right now, clinical data exists in silo databases, all having different for system owners, and if you want to use these data and connect them, you have to establish uh, data sharing agreements, and you have to, uh, with the different particular source owners, and and link data, and and it and it takes it's a complicated process. It's a long, complicated process for the people who want to link that data, and it's a long, complicated process for the health system. But I do want to make a point of saying this isn't the same as administrative data that we collect at Manitoba Center for Health Policy. We do have a process for that, and they have an excellent um, process for linking administrative data. I'm talking about clinical data. The administrative data available through Manitoba Center for Health Policy is really important and answers important questions, but it's not real time. 
It's many years old by the time we get to use it. And it is not what we need for a learning health system where we need to have access and understanding of what's going on with our patients in real time. Um, and that's where real time clinical data as part of a dashboard with integrated and interoperable with our patient reported data is going to give us that full picture. That's our dream place that we want to go. All and right. I, I think, did I see another question pop up? Yeah, Micheline says, uh, great to see this outlined in a strategy for the whole province. Can you share what buy-in was needed to get this started? Uh, yeah, um, well, you know what? I the, the strategy itself has has a forward and support from the, at the time, the ADM of health, um, uh, Manitoba Health. Um, we, our provincial information management and analytics branch at Manitoba Health, um, shared health, digital health. Um, I mean, our major, it, it, because we can't have this without their buy-in. And it, it's really, really dependent on our ability to, you know, have these people behind behind it. So um, we, I did have that buy-in early on. Now, a lot of people have retired and moved on. So it's a little bit, I'm hoping we can still maintain that momentum. There's a lot of distraction in our healthcare system right now. I, I, it sounds like I have, a, everyone is committed to come back to the table for implementation. So all those players are around the implementation table. How long it will take us to implement and what barriers we will face is, you know, any health systems change is going to face probably some barriers there, but we at least have the, the buy-in. Um, so I, I don't know. I just, I pitched it and I, I think that timing was also right. I mean, it's, it's, we're, our system is ready for this and, and this isn't, we're not the first people to do that. It, it's not completely innovative. So it's maybe easier to sell because it's already being done. That's fantastic. I think the examples you gave and the um, having the audience kind of chime in, for, for me, that's helpful to understand a little better what PROMs and PREMs are, because sometimes they're tough concepts to wrap your head around. But I think you did a fantastic job of portraying that and sharing that with us. I don't see any more questions. Um, so unless you have anything to add, I think I will close this session. Um, thank you all for taking the time to be with us this year.